Our exercise turns into being stocked for the next year. So this all started about November, December 2011. I've always had an interest in art and decided to give nude painting a try. Me being the foolish 19 year old I was at the time, stupidly advertised on Craigslist that I like to give painting and modeling a try. I got a reply from a guy named Robert, an older gentleman around late 40s to early 50s, who also had an appreciation for art and had done many nude paintings in his time. We'd email for about a week about the details of it, and he'd express his interest in painting rather than posing, and graciously offered his house as a venue. So, the day comes, and he texts me his address, a beautiful house in a pretty upscale neighborhood. I walk in, and we have a quick chat to calm my nerves. We finish up, and I begin to undress and we start. At the start, he leans in, asking for me to pose on a couch, and starts touching me to adjust my body position. I thought nothing strange of it, until he started moving my leg and ran his hand up my inner thigh near my penis. I stay quiet thinking and hoping that this was just him adjusting my body into the pose he desired. Then he whips out his phone. He insists that the phone he then takes is strictly for a comparison once finished. It lasts over about two and a half hours. Throughout the session, he continually asked about my life like school, job, etc and a lot about my sex life. He flips his easel around and shows me his work, which was somewhat competent, but nowhere near the skill level he had made himself out to have. It was a fairly crude painting that showed he had put a lot of effort in the penis more than anything. As I'm about to leave, he offers me the use of a shower, this being during an Australian summer, so I was dripping with sweat throughout the entire painting session, so I accept. He stands in the bathroom watching me strangely, but at this point, I just want to shower up and leave as quick as I can without any confrontation. I took my eyes off of him for about 30 seconds to wash my face and turn around to find him naked, full erection asking if he could join. I'm shocked at this point and steps aside as he walks in and starts dying to get the fuck out of there. I don't even put my shoes, socks, or my shirt on. I put on my underwear and pants and ran out the door and got fully dressed a few streets away. As I'm walking to the train station, he begins texting me, saying I better come back, or he's going to send out the photo he took, plus more that he must have taken while I was inside the shower. This leads to on and off texting for the next year or so. Every few months, he texts, asking if I come back for another painting session, at one point, offering up to $2,000 to stay the night and do multiple paintings and sending photos of his penis to me all leading to him threatening to somehow blackmail the photos to my work and family, saying I was his gay lover over the last year if I did not come back and have sex with him. I finally made a complaint to the police about the harassment and gave his address and phone number. I haven't heard back from the police yet, but I'm hopeful that this guy is finally out of my life. I was victorious. Three years ago, when I was 17 years old, female, in the month of November, I kept hearing scraping noises outside my window. I was on the second floor, so I automatically dismissed animals as the source of the noise. It happened for every night for three days straight, but I was too afraid to pull back my curtains to see what it was. But on the fourth night, I was absolutely sick of it. So when it started back up again at around 1 a.m. in the morning, I peeked outside of my window. I was met with the sight of a man in black, illuminated by the streetlights behind him. From my little corner of the window, he couldn't see me. I was horrified to see that the scratching noises I had kept hearing were him trying to stealthily open the lock screen on my window. I was stupid and I didn't call 911, but I did the next best thing. Where I live, I have blackout curtains, which were currently covering my window so he couldn't actually really even see if there was any light inside my room. So I turned on my light and grabbed a mask, an anonymous mask. If you must know, it was Halloween. I got really close to the window and threw the curtains open. Man, did he look surprised and let out a yelp. Poor guy fell off the ladder he was on. 
that I did call 911 because the reality had set in that I realized how dangerous a situation it was. He somehow managed to limp off into the night before the police got there, and the police never did manage to find him. There have been reports of the same thing all over the neighborhood, all from teens' girls' windows, but there was never any concrete proof. Turns out, he had been taking the ladder from the garden shed each night, and admittedly very quietly been trying to get inside to my room. I'm going to assume it wasn't a robbery, and his intentions were much more worrying. But I think I really scared him, because he never came back. Creepy fella who's been following my younger sisters. Right. Where do I begin? A bit of background will be grand. I have two younger sisters who are now 17 and 16 years old. But at the beginning of this all would have been around 16 or 15. I myself am 19 years old. Around last November. That's November 2012. My youngest sister decided... She wanted to lose weight and join this diet group called Slim World at a local community center. This center is around a five minute walk from our house, so it was no worry letting her go by herself. It was about 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. if I'm remembering right. She started in September with no problems, and it wasn't until November that she first met this creepy guy. He was of Indian origin, wearing a bright green football jacket an orange pair of tracksuit trousers that just looked pretty odd in general. While she was walking home, he approached her and asked for her number. She was pretty scared, so she gave him a fake number and said something to the effect of, I have to go now. Bye. Despite his efforts at small talk, we all thought that'd be the end of it, but nope. About a week goes by without anything suspicious happening, so we're all pretty happy, and then my youngest sister runs into this fella again, except this time, he happened to be at her bus stop, and again tried engaging in small talk. My sister, despite being the loudest of all my mom's kids, is also the easiest to intimidate, so she shoots to shit with this guy for a while. He has a thick Scottish accent, says he's only over for a few weeks to watch the local football or soccer team play in a cup match before he heads back to Scotland. By this point, she just tells him that she needs to go, but he follows her down the road until the point where she walks down the side road. Then he goes off. Now, my sister being the girl she is, did not follow my advice and go to the corner shop like I had told her, and tell the man at the counter that there was a weird man following her. She instead ran home half terrified. Me and my two sisters decided it'd be best if both sisters traveled to and from school together, which worked for about a week. The next time this creeper was spotted, was extremely terrifying. On the turn into the street we live, he came out of nowhere and approached them with salutations. They both walked really fast home and thankfully, I got a sight of this fella. Green tracksuit top, with jeans walking after my sisters, I sprinted downstairs and opened the gate for my sisters who ran inside, and this cunt decides to do the guy nod at me. I mean mugged him, grabbed him by the collar, and told him, if you ever are near my sister again, I'm going to chop your balls off, put them on a skewer, and feed them to that dog over there. He never said a word. Instead, he hurried off down the street. But even still, that isn't the bloody end. Two days later, remember, this is ten months after all this shit. My youngest sister is walking home from town, the gym, woo. She stuck to her losing weight plan and sees this guy again. He's walking down the road and she's walking up. And they make eye contact and he says, Hey, I know you from somewhere. She just gave the evils and walked on, ignoring him. Hopefully that's the end of him. My dad almost sacrificed himself for me. This memory of mine begins about three years ago when I graduated high school. 
I had grown up with my grandparents, but decided to move to a different and much larger city to live with my dad for the first time in 12 years. I somewhat knew the city already because I spent my summers with him, but this would be the first time I would have the freedom of an adult to come and go as I pleased, drive my car anywhere, smoke cigarettes whenever I wanted to. I was excited, though sad to leave all of my friends. As soon as I was settled in with my dad and stepmom, they sat me down to discuss the few rules and what I needed to know about the complex. Basic things like, go wherever you want, but let us know when you leave and when you're coming back, even if it's 2 a.m. in the morning. Oh, and you'll have to park on a street because the apartment complex has limited parking. One more thing, there's the neighborhood creep. This guy, George, was well known to all the women in the complex, as well as the police that patrol the area. He was tall and fairly huge, very intimidating looking. My parents were pretty certain that he would leave me alone for one reason, my dad. Though George had a habit of stalking other women in the complex, he would stop and find a new target if they had a man make a show of being in their place, a brother, a lover, or a father. It didn't matter what he was to the woman or what he looked like, George would back off immediately. Since I live with my dad, who is also quite tall and rather big, I also felt confident that I'll be alright. And I was. For a time. It started about six months after I moved in. My stepmom and dad were fighting a lot more until she got up and left him. One night, I was sitting on my porch having a cigarette and browsing Facebook or whatever. I wish I could say that I felt like I was being watched, but I probably just looked up because I felt a bug or something like that. George. George was standing about 15 feet away, a little bit behind a tree staring intently at me. I nearly dropped my cigarette. Shakily, I stubbed it out and went inside. I was home alone, so I made sure to lock all of my doors and then played a video game inside my room. I told myself that I was probably just paranoid. The next morning, I got up for my morning cigarette and coffee. Lo and behold, minutes after I got onto my porch, George came ambling out of his apartment to look my way. I sucked down my cigarette and went back inside. This pattern continued for a couple weeks. It was like George stood at a sliding glass door peeking out, waiting to see when I would pop out. I told my dad about it, and he tried to sit with me whenever I went to smoke. If he came with me, George wouldn't even peep ahead out of his door. Of course, the other women in the complex have already tried to call the police about George, but he lives in the complex and staring is not a crime, so there wasn't much that they could do. I didn't know how far George had taken it with the other woman before. With that information in my mind, I knew calling wouldn't be much use. Things slowly escalated. Once my stepmom left, I had access to her parking spot. So I had three ways to get from my car to my apartment depending on how I parked. One of the ways went past George's apartment, about five feet from his door. Since I got off work late most nights, I avoided the route as much as possible. Slowly but surely, like he memorized my schedule, he would be on one of the paths when I was coming home. Not directly on the concrete, but a few feet away on the grass behind a tree. It was like he thought I couldn't see him? Picture a child hiding very terribly behind a tree. You can see 90% of their body and you know that they are there. That's how he would do it. I would rush past him, avoid eye contact, but prepare to scream if I heard him come after me. I start to carry my keys between my fingertips. I bought a pocket knife and I would walk from my car with it halfway open already, even though I've never been in any kind of fight in my life. Around this time, I believe my mom was trying to find me the free self-defense class since I couldn't afford anything on my tight budget. My dad was steadily getting more and more pissed off as George edged closer and closer to escalating as days went by. It went from November to May. If my dad wasn't home, I would lock my bedroom door and keep my knife under my pillow. I would Skype all night with my boyfriend, just so someone could call 911 for me if I needed be. I put a bunch of flower pots in front of my bedroom window so no one could get in silently. I started sitting on the floor of my porch below the wall out of sight to smoke, but angled so I could see him if he walked up to it. 
Nightmares of being kidnapped or raped or murdered started to invade my sleep every night. Then, one day my neighbor, Shell, was gossiping to me. Did you hear about George? No. He got arrested last night. In the complex parking lot, there's a big sort of electrical power box. It stands about waist height and is perhaps two or three feet wide. About ten minutes before I was supposed to come home and park right in front of it, some lady with her kid walking by had saw George sitting on the box, masturbating. Was he there waiting for me? Jerking off to the thought of me seeing him? <sighs> the thought makes me want to puke and scares me all at the same time. I was relieved for a few days of my stress, but it was only a few days that he was gone, then he was back, and he was right back to the same old routine. One night, he got far braver. It was maybe 7 p.m. when I went out for a cigarette with my dad. A neighbor walked up to chat with my dad, and George came outside and stood out in the open, staring me down. Dude's asking to get his fucking ass kicked. My dad said under his breath. Then he chatted to the neighbor some more. I rolled my eyes, went inside, and played some more video games. I was healing in a World of Warcraft dungeon when I heard Shell shouting, Where are you? But I was healing a pretty important job, and I figured she was talking to someone else. Until she burst into my room in a panic, her eyes huge. She hopped from foot to foot frantically like she was doing the potty dance. He's bleeding! Who? I asked in bewilderment. Your dad! Come quick! I made some teenager huffling sound and left my computer, certainly pissing off the rest of the group. I grabbed our, our little first aid kit filled with band-aids. I thought in my mind that my dad was doing something stupid, like tossing up his pocket knife and trying to catch it. But when I stepped outside, I found myself face to face with a real horror. About six people surrounded my dad, including Shell, and my neighbor Caleb held a shirt to my dad's side. He was facing away from me, and his entire back was just covered in blood. It looked like he had been mauled by a bear. That was seriously my first thought. I didn't know we had bears in the city. Caleb's hold on the shirt slipped, and the blood sprayed. I feel queasy writing this down. I have never in my life been the person people turn to in an emergency. Blood makes me lightheaded, and I have anxiety attacks over not being able to find a specific bookmark. But all the adults, people around 30 to 40 years old, while I was just 18, around me were panicked aside from Caleb. I needed to be the person that people turned to. I threw the first aid kit onto the porch and told Shell where we kept our towels. She rushed to go grab one. Has anyone called 911? I shouted. No, my dad said. I can't afford an ambulance. Shut up, I said. What happened? That fucker stabbed me. So I dialed 911 and relayed our address and reason for emergency. Operator told us to keep applying pressure to the wound on my dad's lower back. My dad is a true champ, even though the sidewalk was just one big puddle of blood. He stayed on his feet until someone thought to run and get him a chair. I ran back and forth along the walkways to get the police and show them the house that George lived in, and then I ran back and forth to get the paramedics. They were so cold and so, so agonizingly slow. They walked calmly and I wanted to scream at them to run. My dad is bleeding out. Don't you care? They shoved Caleb out of the way because he refused to let go of my dad's wound and got him packed into the ambulance. I was about to jump on when police stopped me and told me that I had to stay so I can give my statement. My dad shouted at me to call his boss and I remember all of his allergies and whatnot for the paramedics. God, two years later, and all these details have been burned into my brain. I gave my statement to the police. Then, they made me sit outside the complex on the sidewalk for two to three hours. They kept me updated on my dad. Once I called his boss, my boss, and answered my stepmom's message, that's when I allowed myself to break down. I felt like I cried forever. One of the cops was nice enough to go into my house and grab my cigarettes and a bottle of water for me. He stayed with me the entire time to make sure I didn't run off or something, but he was very nice. He offered to let me sit in his cruiser a few times to get away from the cold. George was waiting in his apartment when they came, when they took him out to where I was. He still kept trying to stare at me. 
I stared right back and felt such hatred that I have never in my life felt. I wanted to go over and murder him. My babysitting cop looked over and saw that George was staring, so he used his flashlight to keep George from being able to look at me at all. Once it was all over, I was allowed to go back to my house where I waited for information about my dad. I gathered the story from my neighbors while he was in the hospital for nine days. He had shouted at George to leave his daughter alone, and George had shouted back at him while I was inside the house, totally unaware. George said something along the lines of, Come tell me to my face like a man. So my dad hopped over the porch and waltzed up to him. The creep had been waiting with a 12-inch blade held to the side of his leg. He struck out with his empty hand and then got my dad in the back with a knife. It missed his kidney very, very narrowly. Traveled up and punctured his lung and damaged his diaphragm. My dad didn't realize he had been stabbed at first. He got George into a headlock and pummeled the shit out of him, thinking the dude had just punched him in the kidney. George dropped the knife, rolled in the grass, and picked up another knife. He had been hiding and stabbed my dad again, this time in the upper back. This wound was much more shallow but still required stitches later. At this point, Shell came outside and screamed at my dad that he was bleeding. He took off his shirt, got pissed, and threw it at George. At that point, the neighborhood stalker put his hands up and went into his apartment. The blood stayed on the pavement until about noon the next day, when my neighbors kindly washed it off for me. I still have pictures in my email of it, as well as my dad's injuries. My dad spent more time in the hospital, in critical condition, than George spent being held in jail. I feel like it was my fault. I've been addressing that in therapy, but I still feel awful about it, like... My dad had to fight my own battle for me, you know? Throughout the week, while I was on my porch or just outside, I had so many women come up to me. They all told me to thank my dad for them. They had been terrorized by George at some point, and now they were certain he would be away for good. Several poor women had had George stalk them up to their apartment door and pull his pants down demanding sex. I can't believe the cops couldn't do anything. One of those days, one of my neighbors came up to, to me to tell me that the police and neighbors had searched the complex and found that George had stashed many knives all over the place, buried in gardens, stuck behind trees under his doormat. I shudder to think that he might have planned to one day grab one of his targets and do something far more sinister than stare. George was declared guilty for battery with a deadly weapon but the attempted murder charge was dropped. He was out of prison by Christmas on good behavior or what, what or what not, but my dad and I have a lifelong restraining order against him. He has never tried to come after me, so I can only hope that he's terrified of my dad. I wish I could tell you guys that I took self-defense classes and learned to fight the way my dad can, but I'm still a pussy. He can't even slap a spider, so there's that. My dad is doing all right now. He's just had his third surgery on Tuesday, trying to repair the damage done to him internally. We're hoping that this will be his last, and his quality of life will vastly improve. I probably owe my life to my dad. If he hadn't fought George for me, maybe I would have been the first victim George stabbed. George? Let's not meet again. Crazy glasses loving customer. Hey, let's not meet. This is something that's been happening over the past few months at the store I work at. I work in a mall store. So the storefront is open for anyone to look inside. And the mall is still sort of packed even when it's closing time for the building. I'm not sure if it is someone trying to stalk me or just plain harass me. I never thought it would happen since I'm an average guy, tall and skinny. Dark hair, brown eyes, and glasses. Not very interesting, right? Apparently not. This all started in November of last year when I was around 19 years old, and some normal looking guy, a bit chubby, came into the store and looked around. Probably excited to see all these board games, I guess. I of course go up to ask, welcome, 
Is this your first time inside the store? He gives me a look as of saying to back off, so I do just that, and head behind the counter to finish what I was doing. After about half an hour, he comes up to the counter and just stands there staring at me. So I ask, can I help you with something? I know there's a lot of stuff to look at. He just continues to stare at me. So I smile and decide to clean the store just to get away from this guy. It works and he leaves the store. Around the end of the day, very close to the time I have to close up the store, he walks back in. I think, well, maybe he'll buy something now. Of course not, how silly of me. He goes right up to me as I'm cleaning up and places his hand on my shoulder and says, I like your glasses. I freak out and pretty much kick him out and threaten to call security. He leaves and I quickly lock the door without bringing in the signs we have outside. He stands there, kicks over the sign and then stares at me with a huge smirk on his face. I decide to go back in and call my roommate to come by, but by the time I go back out, he's gone. So I bring the signs in. Nothing happens for a couple months and my birthday rolls, since I'm working for minimum wage. I decide I should go in and get some of that extra birthday money. I also decide to wear contacts that day. Of course, I see this dude wandering outside of the store every time I look up from helping a customer. Most likely, he didn't want to come in either when it, when it was full or since my coworker was still on shift. After my coworker leaves, and pretty much all the customers do as well, Glasses Fan walks in while I'm helping someone figure out a gift for their daughter and he just comes behind me and places his hand on my shoulder again. Oh, why aren't you wearing glasses today? You look so handsome. I look at the person I was helping, doing my best to ignore this person, and the customer gives me an awkward chuckle, as if he was unsure if this was a friend of mine or not. So he then decides he's going to get his gift and quickly leave. He then starts talking to me about how he's sorry he kicked over the signs last time he was here, and then he gave me a rock and said happy birthday. I lost my shit at this point and told him to leave and called security while he continued to hover over the counter, getting more and more pissed off, spouting nonsense about how skinny people shouldn't starve themselves or something like that. Finally, security came in and pulled him out of the store. Again, nothing happened for months, but I got a package at work, which is weird because my shipping address for everything is my apartment. My manager hands me the package and I instantly know whose it's from, but I open it anyways, because I'm not sure what else to do. Inside was three pairs of glasses, all in my exact prescription. Yes, I did try them on, still not sure why. The next day, he walks in without even caring the store was full, and I was with a coworker today. He essentially asked me out on a date, to which I fight the urge to say something incredibly horrible to him, and just say, oh no thanks, I have a girlfriend, and I don't want to break out with her. This seems to startle him, and he just started yelling about how I shouldn't have let him on and told him I was gay. My mouth just hangs open, and my coworker just calls security, but Glasses Fan leaves before they come this time. I have a feeling this is not the end of this guy, but I really hope it is because I love working in the store. So, weird glasses creep, let's not meet again. Don't look at me like that. Okay, so this hasn't really got anything to do with the paranormal, but it scared the shit out of me. I still haven't and probably never will get over it. Last year in November, I caught the train up to the city to my work. When I caught the train, it was mostly empty. A few people who looked like they were going to work. At one of the stops, a lady who looked to be in mid-30s came in. She had a white blouse on, long black trousers. Her hair was pulled into a bun and she carried a handbag. She looked like another person just going to work. Out of the most empty train, she sat next to me. Come on, I had my headphones on and was happily listening to my music. That was until the lady started making small talk. It went sort of like this. You have very nice skin. Thank you. You should be welcome. I don't compliment people. Uh, okay. Be careful. Yeah, I will. Yeah, so that's good and well. I get off the train and walk to my work. That lady got off at the same spot. I work in a small cafe. And I was on the till this day. 
It was a really quiet day, which was weird, as it was a Monday. I sat at the counterboard, out of my mind, and what do you know, train lady comes in. She places her order and then starts conversation again. Why do you look at me like that? Pardon me, ma'am? Like what? Don't fucking look at me like that! She was yelling now. Ma'am, I'm sorry. If you don't calm down, I'll call security. What the actual fuck? She leans over the counter and grabbed my hair like it was, I don't know, a door handle? She started to try and pull my head towards her. By this time, my employees had become alarmed and had come out. This lady still has a fist full of my hair, and then she lets go suddenly. I fall back into my employee, and the lady smiles at me and says, Now I have a souvenir. I prefer your skin, though. And then she casually leaves. We lure the police. And that lady never came back. Let's not meet, train lady. We never made it inside. I've been a long time reader and decided to make an account to share this story with all of you. Not simply just because it has stuck with me, but because I am sure that you will have a great hypothesis about what happened to me that night and who it was exactly that I encountered. It all started several years ago me and my friend's interest in urban exploration. I was a junior in high school at the time, which was when everyone started to earn a lot more freedom. So, we took the chance to be out late whenever we could. Now, keep in mind that I live in a major city in central Colorado, so the nightlife is never lacking. We could always find something to do, and we were especially drawn if there was an element of danger. We wouldn't always plan these trips. But we made sure as hell that if we were going into any old building inside the dark, we would have a knife and a flashlight for safety. We never really had to defend ourselves, but we came very close one evening. It must have been around November, because there wasn't yet snow on the ground, but it was a chilly evening. Directly across the street from the abandoned hospital, which we have hypothesized is still around from the TB era. There's a hospital that is newer and in use. The two are connected by an underground tunnel, which I can only assume was a way to move bodies without alerting the patients. This is a common feature amongst old hospitals. We have been inside the hospital a few times, but never found, found anything strange. Only the occasional sign of others having been or lived there. What was piquing our interest that night was the abandoned library next door to that hospital. It was connected, but only by exterior walls. To get inside, you could not cut through the hospital, but instead had to hop over a tall wall and climb a very tall fence. A few of us had backpacks containing the aforementioned safety precautions and a couple bottles of water, so nothing too heavy or valuable. A little ways off the road, it was dark if you clung to the building. We did it for a while, before stepping behind a small patch of shrubbery, which we determined was an easy way over the first wall, since the only other way to gain access was by a chained, unclimbable gate at the bottom of a set of stairs facing away from the ledge. Both were parallel with the library, so when tucked back in that corner behind the bushes, no one can see us from the street. I don't believe I went first but I did not remain behind to be last over that wall. It was too high for me to jump and haul myself over, so I resorted to stepping on a pipe jutting out somewhere lower along the wall. It gave me a bit of needed boost, and soon I was up and over, moving into the library's courtyard. Another girl and I waited for our two other girlfriends to join us. Upon an initial glance over the courtyard, there was no obvious way inside. To our right was a dilapidated fountain, which I took joy in imagining spring forward a spray of water from its detailed stonework in the brighter summer months, people laughing and talking with the surrounding trees bringing them shade. Now, however, it had long been in disuse, 
and the earth at our feet was cold and hard. There were no signs of another soul for years, save the 15-foot chain-link fence directly in front of us, separating the courtyard in half. I could tell it hadn't seen the same weather as the rest of the courtyard, because the metal showed no signs of rust. That must be our way in, we agreed, because with a fence like that, someone obviously wanted to keep us out. We hurled our bags over the fence, hearing them clank on the ground rather silently due to their lightness. I was the third over, because I have a slight fear of climbing, and it took me a bit to mentally prepare myself. I made it to the top of the fence in short time, then sat up atop shrouding with a leg on either side. I had two girls on the other side in front of me, and one behind me, who was telling me to hurry up. I spent a good couple of minutes up there doing another mental preparation and some deep breathing exercises, then climbed down to wait for the last girl. At the time, I was thinking that that had been one of the scariest things I've done in a very long while, because I tend to avoid climbing at all costs. Of course, this is an irrational fear, as I have never fallen, but that phobic fear didn't even compare to what happened next. The last girl's feet hit the ground and all four of us split up in the smaller half of the courtyard, looking for any kind of entrance at all. We decided that breaking a window would be too loud and draw unwanted attention, not to mention that we could get really cut up, you know? So that was not an option. Searching for a little while longer, we did not find anything that looked remotely plausible until we found a grate near the base of where two walls met. I couldn't believe we hadn't noticed it before, and upon closer inspection, the grate was already moved slightly from its resting place, so it would be easier to lift the rest of the way. The smallest and least fearful of our group went first. After moving the grate, there was a small drop down. It was no more than three feet down and two feet wide, but inside was another drop down, where we could see into the library basement. She hopped down into the small square landing, only to almost immediately freeze. We looked amongst ourselves, wondering what was wrong. There's a guy down there, she said. What? Where? I can see his outline, she said. I leaned forward and tried to make out a shape, but it was further down than my line of sight permitted and too dark. Hello? She called out. He responded the same, asking who we were. Just a couple of chicks, she spat out bluntly. What he said next sent chills down my spine, and it was as if I could feel the darkness radiating out of that hole inside the ground. All of a sudden, it was very still and quiet, like that darkness had spilled out and weighed all of us down in that gloomy courtyard. He said what I, and what I can only describe as a lustful tone dripping with ill intent. I'm addicted to following the sound of women's voices. My friend looked over at us blankly, but there was a nervousness underneath, unease. Something in his voice sounded like it wasn't an empty threat. Like he wasn't just saying something creepy to get us to leave. She looked back to where he was and said slowly, That's not cool. The man under that dark earth began laughing manically, and not in the kind of way a really good actor does. In a way that we could feel his utter insanity hit us like stale air. We looked at each other for what felt like hours in that gloomy courtyard, but I knew it was only a couple seconds, because we all exchanged without even speaking that we had to get out of there, and now. I was not about to risk some nutcase coming after us, even if we did outnumber him. The friend scrambled up and out of the landing, and I was never over a fence faster in my life. Fifteen foot potential fall, and I didn't even have time to think about it. We didn't stop running, until we were on the street and halfway down the block, out of breath. I can still hear that laugh. So guy in a storm drain. Let's not meet. A brief taste of fame. I currently live abroad working in Japan. It's funny how in America everyone called me the Asian, for now I've moved, I'm always the foreigner. Truthfully, I'm half. 
I thought I'd fit right in here before I first came, but now I've come to find I always stick out like a sore thumb wherever I go. Walking down the street in my old community, absolutely everyone seemed to know who I was. It got so bad that strangers, people I never interacted with or been introduced to, will look at me and blurt out my name. In any case, I've had a couple of creepy experiences. My first one happened after a couple of friends invited me over for a party. I left the party with one friend so we could catch the trains back before midnight. But even after we arrived at the station, we stood around chatting until about 3 a.m. Eventually, we realized how late it was and parted ways. That's when some guy on a motorcycle began telling me. It was about a 15-minute walk from the station to my apartment, with no police stations in between. He followed me slowly, telling me repeatedly to get on his bike with him. I kept ignoring him, hoping he'd just assume I didn't speak Japanese. Even if I ran, I knew he could easily catch me on his bike and it was pretty much a straight line back to my apartment. I tried to pretend to not notice him the entire way until I reached the one turn I have, I bolted. I heard his motorcycle rev behind me as he gave chase, but luckily, I made it up the stairs and inside my room. I sat with my back against the door almost the whole night, too afraid to move or turn on a light, for fear he'd be able to tell which room was mine from the window. Probably unrelated, months later in November, our friend visited, and I let her stay with me. After the first night, she realized she'd forgotten to bring a towel. I said, no problem, and proceeded to run across the street to the convenience store to pick one up. I trotted back to the apartment, new towel in hand. We chatted a bit more before I turned and saw someone violently trying my door handle. I froze, too shocked to move. I just bought a towel. Was someone trying to catch me showering? The door thing happened a few more times but I was always too scared to approach the door and look out the people to see who it was. Locking my door was a habit I picked up in America after dealing with a stalker there, and seeing people try to get in kind kind of only reinforced that habit, you know? I never went to the police, though, since I didn't know what to tell them. No one had actually ever broken in. Finally, around February, I decided to visit Tokyo, but a gigantic snowstorm arrived at the same time I did. A friend allowed me to stay with her, I meant to visit my sort of boyfriend while she was at work, but he canceled at the last minute due to the snow. I returned to my friend's apartment and waited for her to get home. Maybe an hour after I settled in, I heard a sharp knock at the door. I shrugged it off, figuring whoever it was wanted my friend, not me. After the second knock, I tiptoed over to the door to see if I could see who it was. Now, I don't know if this is a normal thing, but no one I've talked to has ever had this experience before. The doorknob began twisting, just like at my own apartment, miles and miles away. And even when it stopped, I could hear someone pacing outside in the snow. I was so scared, I dove back into my bedroom and hid until my friend came home. It was probably just a coincidence, but it really freaked me out. My friend said she never had an experience like that before or since. She wasn't expecting anyone that day, and all her packages get sent to her work, so it wasn't the postman. In the end... I moved far away, and haven't had any more similar experiences. Four AM, what are you doing here? All right. Stumbling over this subreddit made me remember this one encounter some 12 years ago. I was working my first job, driving a wheel loader at a recycling company. Picture a quite big area with gigantic piles of scrap metal, and in the middle was an enormous building for processing paper. So, it's 4 a.m. early November, and I'm blasting the heater, hoping the warm air will start flowing before I turn into a popsicle. November mornings in Sweden are cold and dark, and I'm working overtime, so I have this place to myself. Well, dark if you don't count the ten or so extra lights fitted to the machine. They are all aimed to the ground, though, around you, so you don't run over people with the disadvantage of making everything more than ten yards away into solid darkness. So, I'm sitting there in the middle of the yard, shivering, sipping coffee, smoking, and hating life in general, when I see someone materializing from the dark. My first instinct is that 
someone else figured they could use the overtime. But this person is coming from in between two piles of scrap metal and, well, beyond that is fences, barbed wire, and thick forest. He's walking in my general direction, but not exactly towards me. And everything is just wrong about this guy. He's not mean looking or anything like that. Normal height, normal build, maybe in his 40s, normal clothes, but no jacket, which made me wonder how he could stand the cold like that. So I study him as he approaches. He's constantly looking around him, and when he gets closer, I can see that his face and clothes are dirty, as if he has walked through the forest from the city, which is probably a good three-hour walk in daylight. He stops in front of the wheel loader, a bit to the left, but he never acknowledges the fact that I'm there. Here's this 20-ton machine, idling with mentioned lights, but he just looks right through it, constantly searching for something else. I'm not scared. Well, okay, I am a little bit scared, but you gotta be polite, so I open the door with some measure of hesitance. Are you... I lean back in and kill the engine so he can actually hear me. Are you okay? Nothing. I'm not there. This is a restricted area. You can't, um, really be here. He starts tapping his foot and biting his, his thumbnail as if he's nervous. And I just remember that everything from his appearance to his body language is just so out of sync with the whole situation. I try again. Do you live around here? It's really cold. Can I get you some coffee? Not even a glance at me. Not on nothing. I really begin to freak out. Should I call the security company? Maybe the police or ambulance? Drive back home and call in sick? I try a few more questions, but I get nowhere, and I'm not willing to climb down either, so I just sit there and look at him. It feels like forever, but it was probably just a few minutes. Then he looks straight at me, right in the eyes. He doesn't say anything, just holds the stare for a few moments and then walks away. Once again, absolutely non-threatening. He just looked tired and kind of haunted or something, and I'm no longer shivering from the cold. I shiver, because it's one hour since I awoke and I'm already having enough of this day. Eventually, I call the guard company when I'm fairly sure I won't have a panic attack, and they come and I talk to them into calling the police, because once I calm down, I realize that this guy could very well be in a crappy mental state and maybe hurt himself, but I never heard anything about it again. Writing this down, I feel like an overreacting drama queen, but back then, I felt like I was in an episode of X-Files or something. Though whoever you are... I hope you're doing okay, but please let's not meet in the dark again. Popular Kid Becomes Closet Case Creeper I went to high school with this boy named JC. He was kind of popular. He played some kind of sport that I don't remember. I think he dated a cheerleader. In general, everyone really liked him. And I perceived him to be as normal. He's a self-proclaimed redneck. He now works as a plumber. He loves tractors and beer. As for me, being one of the only gay people in a small rural town, I was not so popular. I was in the choir and performed in the school musicals. So that in combination with my homosexuality pretty much doomed my social life. I dressed weirdly and was tall and lanky. Now I live in a city, gained some muscle, and am a lot less awkward. I came into my own, if you will. Needless to say, I was not friends with JC in high school. I mean, we never talked or really even interacted. I had home room with him and that was it. The one time I even had a semblance of an interaction with him, was the summer before my freshman year of college. My best friend Stacy and our, our other friend Mark were bored one Saturday night and were driving around town posting these creepy flyers we found online. I don't know if anyone remembers that minor alternate reality game, 8311. It was some weird website with a picture of a creepy girl with 8311 on the bottom. Supposedly, something awful was supposed to happen on that date. It was obviously fake and harmless, so we thought we could scare our friends by posting the cryptic posters near their houses. In hindsight, that does seem pretty weird, but that's not the point of this story. Anyways, as we were posting a flyer, JC rolls up in his truck and asks what we were doing. Stacy blows our cover and flat out tells him everything. 
I say no words during this whole exchange. She begs him not to tell anyone. He leaves. We move on. That was the last time I saw him since I graduated and went to college. Flash forward to November of this year. I get a weird Facebook message from JC. We aren't friends. I vaguely remember him. He says we haven't talked in a while and was wondering how I was doing. He says I need to text him because he has a question for me. Like I said, I wasn't really popular in high school, so my immediate instinct is that homeboy is making fun of me. I ignore the message. Ten minutes later, he says, please. I ignore again. Another few minutes, please. You won't regret it, trust me. Now, I am intrigued. I imagine him drunk with a bunch of other assholes that went to my school sitting around, deciding to pick on the random gay kid they haven't seen in years. Regardless, I wanted to see what angle they were playing at, so I responded. I decided to go with, do I know you, route. He explains that we graduated high school together and starts making small talk. Not wanting to have my time wasted, I ask him to get to the point. He makes me text him. By now, all my college friends are reading this exchange over my shoulder. I text him from my friend's phone. He says he has something to tell me, but I can't tell anyone. He also demands to know if I'm in my house and whom I'm with. A variety of things are running through my head now. I'm a little scared by his need to know where I am and who I'm with. Not not too scared though, because I'm, I'm hours away in a different city. I still think I'm being picked on too, but I had my fair share of closeted gays coming out to me, and this definitely seemed like the start of something like that. After telling him to cut the chase again, he tells me he is bi, and that I'm really hot, and that he has a weird fetish he wants to tell me about. After me telling him how this is kind of weird to be telling a stranger, he reveals that his fetish is that he likes to wear women's underwear by now. I'm sure I'm being made fun of. I stop talking to him. I tell Stacy everything. She tells me that while this was going on, he was also talking to her and telling her the same story as well. That did not surprise me too much, because everyone knows Stacy and I are best friends, so if you fuck with one, you might as well fuck with the other, right? He asked her all sorts of questions about me, like if I swallow, and who have I had sex with in our town. Stuff that was beginning to cross the line, even for a mean-spirited prank. I tell her to just ignore him. Then he drops a bombshell. He sends her pictures. Pictures of him, and a variety of women's underwear. Pictures of his dick. It's no longer a joke. It's only just creepy. This guy that we've never talked to and haven't seen in years is telling us deep personal secrets that no one else knows. I was shocked. He then asked Stacy to take pictures of him in his underwear and to buy him some as well. She of course declines. He then follows me on Twitter. My Twitter isn't linked to anything, and you can't find it by searching my name. It's possible he found it through a mutual friend, but I only follow maybe like two people from my hometown. It would require a lot of digging. It was bizarre. All his tweets were about how much he loves his girlfriend. He is living two drastically different lives. We don't hear from our cross-dressing friend for another few weeks. I didn't tell anyone the exact date I was coming home for winter break. I didn't post it online, anywhere. I pull into my driveway for the first time in months, and not five minutes later do I get another message from JC. He demands I text him. I'm blunt now, and Fleto tells him that I think it's really inappropriate for any of this to be happening. He ignores me and asks if I would have sex with him. I say no! He asks if I swallow, I flip my shit, and tell him that he is being unacceptable, but on a deeper level. I understand the struggles of being gay or bi in our small town. I tell him to get grinder and look for anonymous sex there, if, if, he, if he needs it so much. But he won't be having any of it with me. He tells me I'm hot. I say I know. End of conversation. This whole situation really freaks me out. I've never talked to this kid in my life. He never came off as gay to me. He has a girlfriend yet told me he has down low sex with a bunch of other straight guys. And then the woman's underwear thing. Like, that's a fine fetish to have, I guess. But it's just so unexpected. What really gets to me is that the fact that he seemed to know exactly when I came into town. He literally began talking to me again the day of. Also, my parents just got their bathroom remodeled. I wonder if he worked with a plumbing company that was in my house. It's very unnerving. I, I feel like he's a criminal minds case waiting to happen. Like, if I got, got caught alone with him, I would end up in pieces in some cardboard box.
I thank you all the time. I spent half of my junior year of college in Florence, Italy, where I studied art history, fascist cinema, and alcohol. My classmate Susan and I had become friends with a pair of hipster bartenders at a seedy pub, the kind of place that has a hole in the floor instead of a toilet, and spent a lot of weeknights there chilling with our Italian pals and drinking horrible, sickly sweet shooters. Susan was the kind of person who was always striking up conversations with strangers, often telling them complete lies about who we were and where we were from. She also liked to jump into strangers' cars and force me to come with her, but surprisingly, that's not how my creepiest experience abroad came to pass, no. Susan just happened to strike up a conversation with some random Italian dude at the pub one night, and this dude had some friend named Fabi. I honestly don't remember much about the first night we met, as I had already inhibited a good amount of my body weights. I do remember that he was a tall and muscular and dressed like your typical Euro dude circa mid-2000s, complete with a crispy faux hawk. And I remember that near the end of the night, as I was preparing to walk home, he grabbed my face in his hands and forced his tongue inside my mouth. I think I laughed it off and left. I know I wasn't upset, but not that all into it either. The next day, I started getting texts on my rented Nokia from an unfamiliar number. It turns out Susan, being a complete idiot, has passed my number on to Fabi. The messages are harmless and even kind of sweet at first. In Italian, he writes that I've stolen his heart, blah blah blah. I write something like, thank you, thank you, because I'm also stupid and think it might be cool to get to know some of the new locals, right? That night, Susan and I go to the pub as usual. I don't see Fabi there, but on the walk home, I notice there are hearts with my name inside them, drawn on the windshields of three different cars on my street. It was November time, and I lived very close to the Arno, so there was always a layer of mist or frost on everything. The next morning, I wake up to an ESL text from Fabi. I thank you all the time. I find his attempt at flirting in English more hilarious than creepy, but I don't respond to it because this dude is coming on way too strong. Not to mention, I'm totally weirded out that he apparently knows where I live. Susan swears that she didn't tell him where I lived, but I don't really trust her because she's a giant drunk. Besides, I'm too freaked out to seriously consider the alternative that he followed me home that very first night. I just decided to let it fade out, right? But he kept texting, and eventually his messages start to get angry. He accuses me of being just like every other American girl, kissing men and not even caring who you hurt, and insist I let him on. After about 15 of these texts, I told him to stop contacting me or I'll go to the police. Incredibly, the text stop. All good. Until a few weeks later, the night before I go home for Christmas break, I'm walking home from that terrible pub by myself again. Same route as always, maybe 3 in the morning? I'm so drunk! I almost didn't notice that. There are little drawings in the windows of the cars on my street. There was a frowny face with long hair and X's for eyes in one, and a hangman with a skirt in another. I sprinted the last block to my apartment with 9-11 already pressed into my phone. I was too drunk to consider that the number in Italy was completely different. Thankfully, Fabi did not jump out of the shadows, I think. He just wanted me to know that he could.